The West Virginia Supreme Court is the highest court in the state. I'll talk with the court's Chief Justice, Menas Ketchum, right now on The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Closed captioning for The Law Works is made possible by a grant from the Monongalia County Bar Association to support legal information and education for all West Virginians. The Law Works is made possible by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and legal system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. By the generous support of Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975, providing high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems, as well as PC-based systems. And by viewers like you. One of the functions of the Chief Justice of the West Virginia Supreme Court is to monitor and react to the pressures, both internal and external, upon the West Virginia justice system. My guest is Chief Justice Menes Ketchum. Chief Justice Ketchum, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. You sit in kind of an exalted position uh, as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and you get to see a lot of things that would not be apparent to lawyers or to members of the community generally. What, what do you see as, as the biggest pressures, the biggest concerns about the justice system in our state? Well, frankly, uh, I think it's the middle class can't afford lawyers. Uh, we've always had a concern of the poor couldn't afford a lawyer, and we develop programs for the poor, but I think it's come to the point where the middle class cannot afford lawyers. Uh, can I give you an example? Surely. Uh, my wife had a uh, lawsuit. And so I went to check for lawyers and tried to, you know, I know the good lawyers, to check and, and see what they charged. And everywhere I went, it was $300 to $350 an hour. Well, it didn't take me long uh, to figure out that if they spent 10 hours on her case, they were going to charge as much in those ten hour, for those 10 hours as I take home a month. And it, it really it struck me that this is a real problem in our state. As a result, uh, she handled the lawsuit herself, although she had a ghostwriter. And we should tell people that while today you're the Chief Justice of the West Virginia Supreme Court, you had a lot of experiences on the road to getting there. Oh, absolutely, yes. You, you practiced a lot of law and from pretty much every direction that you can practice law in. Right. I, uh, I was a trial lawyer for 41 years and uh, you kind of get classified, but uh, I probably defended as many insurance companies in as many cases as I did for the plaintiff. Uh, if we took a tally, we would probably find that I defended more cases than I prosecuted for the plaintiff. And that's just civil law. That's just civil law. Well, yeah, and I, I did criminal law, tried a lot of rapes and, uh, and murders and all kinds of criminal cases. That experience, though, really does, in my opinion, look good on a resume when you want to become a judge or a justice of the Supreme Court? Well, it may look good on the resume, but uh, what it really is, it, it gives you a lot of practical experience. Uh, when the lawyers come before you, you know what's going on, and they're not going to talk around you. And they're not going to baffle you. Oh, no, no. <laughs> but uh, it, I did have a rounded practice, but it, but it was all with regard to the trying of lawsuits, criminal and civil. The kind of stuff that you now sit in judgment on. Correct. That's absolutely correct. 
it, you talked about the middle class and their inability to afford the lawyers that are out there to serve them. There has been much discussion of late about the separation of the classes, that there is no middle class anymore, that what used to be the middle class, if they don't become part of the 1% are becoming part of the lower class. And lawyers for members of the lower classes are not only, have not always always been hard to find, but are increasingly hard to find now. Well, and that's true. You know, uh, we have a legal aid system in West Virginia uh, for the poor in civil cases. And we had 52 uh, legal aid attorneys in West Virginia to handle the 55 counties, to, to handle all these, which wasn't enough. And now with the cutbacks in Washington, we're going to drop to 44 legal aid lawyers to cover the entire state to represent the poor in our courts. And it, it's, it's, it, we have to find a solution. It's a dilemma. And we're going to have to, uh, I just don't know what the solution will be with the cut of funding from Washington. Well, there has been suggestions that lawyers should be doing more pro bono work, that is, working for free or significantly reduced fees. Uh, Dan, you're exactly right, but uh, very few lawyers uh, will help a middle class person or a poor person for free or at reduced fees in civil cases. Uh, statistically, it's shown that nationwide about only about 24% of the lawyers will consider doing pro bono work. And it's diminishing every year. Now when I started practicing law, uh, the lawyers felt it, and that was a long time ago in 1966, 67, the lawyers felt it was their obligation to handle pro bono work. And uh, the judges would call you and say, I have a civil case. These people can't afford a lawyer. Come over here. I want you to do it. But we've gotten away from being a profession where the profession is greater than charging $350 an hour. And taking our share of pro bono work or for free work for people that can't afford it to now it's just all about money. And, and it's really a dilemma, and I think that we need to do something to, uh, to require lawyers to do pro bono work. Well, most of the lawyers that I know do do some. But in my office, I can tell you that every day, we'll get at least one phone call, and some days two or three phone calls, from somebody looking for a pro bono lawyer. And when you dig a little bit deeper, sometimes you find out that uh, they're not indigent. They just don't want to pay a lawyer. They feel entitled to a lawyer to represent them for free because, well, they're just nice people. So those we have to discard. In fact, if, if you are in difficulties, you do need a lawyer and you can't afford a lawyer, your best course of action is to contact uh, the West Virginia Legal Aid and their phone number is in the book, and they will refer you to a lawyer who will represent you for free or for a reduced fee if they cannot take your case. Uh, good luck with that. I, I can't tell you how well that works. I just don't know, but it, it's, it is reaching crisis uh, proportions now. Well, and, and you, you're to be complimented and the lawyers you practice with, but I'll bet you're not a big law firm of 30, 40, 50 lawyers. No, I'm one lawyer with one secretary and one but, office. But if you go to the, uh, it's becoming a trend, you go to the law firm of 30, 40, 50 lawyers, they have a quota, you got to generate so many billable hours a year, it's all business, and they, and there is nothing in their policies that says, well, you know, if you do 10 hours of pro bono work, that'll count towards your 2,500. And, and uh, the statistics nationwide support that. And, and there's just no way that 42 legal aid lawyers can handle the civil cases for the poor in this state. I, I would be surprised if 42 legal aid lawyers could handle the 
civil cases in Kanawha County or in Monongahela County or in Ohio County or Wood County, counties with significant populations. Yeah. Well, you know, our rules of conduct, professional conduct, only say that a lawyer should do pro bono work. The American Bar Association's uh, model rules are much tougher, and they say that a lawyer should do 50 hours a year of pro bono work. Uh, the problem is, is that's a voluntary standard. You, uh, there's nothing in our rules of professional conduct, there's nothing in the ABA model rules that require the lawyers to do pro bono work. The fact of the matter is, the license to practice law is a privilege, not a right. And it is a privilege to make a lot of money. And if we're going to be a profession, not a business, then we need to implement uh, some sort of mandatory pro bono work to require the lawyers to give a little bit of their time to help the middle class and the poor that cannot afford lawyers. We're talking about the West Virginia Supreme Court and the West Virginia justice system. My guest is Chief Justice Menace Ketchum. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. The other side of that coin is, and I don't know if people are generally aware of it, we have an awful lot of lawyers in West Virginia who are not doing well financially. I usually refer to it as a lot of $30,000 a year lawyers. Uh, now, to many people, $30,000 a year is a lot of money, but when you have to pay for perhaps an assistant, you have to pay for office space, you have to pay for the books and the education to be a lawyer, that's not a lot of money. Uh, so we seem to have a fragmented group of attorneys in this state too, some who do real, real well and make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, and some who are just squeaking by. Well, I think you'll find, and I don't have any statistics, uh, it's just my opinion, and everybody has the right to an opinion, and I got them, uh, that it's the $30,000 a year lawyers. From what I've seen over practicing law for 41 years, it's the $30,000 a year lawyers that are doing the pro bono work. And, and, and Dan, it's got to change. It's, got, it's, it's a dilemma where somebody has a wife and two children and uh, works in the factory or has a good paying job that, uh, that can't afford to get a competent lawyer because they can't afford them. And, and I have, uh, the lawyers don't like this, and, but I honestly think that we should uh, require mandatory pro bono work for the lawyers in this state to give a little bit of their time. And, and, and I, you know, I always thought that pro bono work was rewarding. Uh, not only did I learn a lot in a lot of those cases because I didn't deal in those fields of law, but uh, I, I thought it was really rewarding. So what would hurt to require every lawyer in this state to handle one legal aid case a year? Now, go ahead and exclude divorce cases. It's a little bit complicated. What would hurt for every lawyer to hand, handle one legal aid uh, case a year and have legal aid assign them, have legal aid keep track of whether they do them? And, you know, if we did that, we would not have a problem with the poor or the middle class being unrepresented in, in our courts. In fact, legal aid is set up to do what you propose. They just don't have enough lawyers to do it with. That's correct. There's 42 in this state, or it's soon to be 42 in this state, legal aid lawyers. Should the lawyers uh, in West Virginia anticipate that as the Chief Justice, this is something you're going to promote and seek? Well, I'm going to espouse it. Uh, I, I, I think first, uh, it's, it's got to be put out there and, and let the lawyers get mad at me and take their shots at me and then uh, have a discussion of it. And I think the first discussion will be, and you'll hear the lawyers uh, rend their clothes and gnash their teeth 
if we adopt the model ABA rule, like other states have, that they're required to do 50 hours, a, or that they should do 50 hours a year of pro bono work. So first you have to have a discussion uh, rather than just mandate it. Let's talk about some of the other pressures uh, that are on the system now. We frequently hear on an annual basis that West Virginia is a judicial hellhole. Now, you've been a practicing lawyer, and you were a plaintiff's lawyer. You were a defense lawyer. Now you're on the Supreme Court. Just how much hell is there in West Virginia? Well, there's there's really none. And if you and I, uh, that they came around uh, from the National Chamber of Commerce, not the State Chamber of Commerce, the National Chamber of Commerce. So let me address it in a couple of ways. First. If we went to the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce, if we went to the businesses around this state, if we went to coal, if we went to the hospitals, if we went to the doctors, they'd say, we like our system. It's doing really good. And I have people every day just to tell me that. So where is this moniker coming from? Well, as one businessman told me from New York, you know, nobody thinks that, uh, any, nobody outside West Virginia talks about West Virginia being a hellhole. It's always in West Virginia. And it comes from this one uh, study, uh, and the people surveyed in the study don't practice law in West Virginia, don't know anything about West Virginia. And so the National Chamber of Commerce wants an intermediate court of appeals in this state, and they're going to keep on this hellhole uh, label until they get an intermediate court of appeals. We're talking about the West Virginia Supreme Court and the justice system in West Virginia. My guest is Chief Justice Menace Ketchum. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. What do you think about the idea of an intermediate court? Well, uh, our appeals, are down since, 19, uh, since 2007, 52%. And in 2006 and 2005, there was a lot of cases, a lot of appeals filed because we were transferring from the old workers' comp system to the new workers' comp system. And in 2000, Seven, there were 2,966 workers' comp appeals filed, and darn near that many in 2006. The workers' comp appeals are down 82% since 2007. So what I'm telling you is that with our caseload now, there was 570, only 572 workers' comp appeals last, last year. And with our workload now, Actually, uh, we could use more work. Actually, I'd love to see another five or 600 appeals filed a year because we handle them very easily. Everything's reviewed very thoroughly. So, having said that, why do you need, they say, well, the court's too busy. They based that on the 2005, 2006, 2,500, 3,000 workers' comp appeals that we no longer have. Well, if the five of us are too busy, then how is an intermediate appellate court that was proposed of three people, how are they going to handle it if the five of us can't? The, the, the point is, we're not overworked. We have plenty of time to handle them and take our time, and to just for the sake of spending $13, $15 million a year to, to hire, uh, to put in place another court. Uh, I know that Hoppy Kirchhoff up here in Morgantown said, well, the Supreme Court's against it to take away uh, some of their power. It wouldn't take away our power. It'd give us more power. It'd give us three or five more judges to boss around. And it's, it's, it's just not needed. Now, one of the things it does do uh, that I really oppose. It gives every criminal defendant an extra appeal. 
Now, most of the criminal defendants in this state are indigent. They don't have the money to hire a lawyer, and by the Constitution of West Virginia and, and the United States, we pay for a lawyer. So now they have one appeal that the taxpayers pay for. With the intermediate court appeals, the taxpayers now get to pay for two appeals. It just doesn't make sense. And in those cases where the parties are paying for their lawyers, they're going to pay for another appeal. They're going to pay double. And so why, when our court has plenty of time to, to fully consider every appeal, why have an intermediate step that's going to add another six or eight months to the process before it gets to the final court, us? And why add another ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars in attorney fees? It doesn't make sense. Now, if we were busy, so busy that we couldn't, uh, there's there's no appeal that comes up there that we can't read and study all the briefs and make a, a really informed decision on. And in fact, you're now issuing opinions in the application for appeal process, where somebody brings their case to you we, and says, we'd like, to, we'd like to appeal this, will you accept the case? Uh, we, we issue a written opinion in every case. And, and Dan, you know, the court doesn't like me to talk because I always get on a roll. Well, let me tell you something. 80% of the appeals we see are frivolous or border on the fri or border on being frivolous. Every 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 criminal gets a free attorney, a free right of appeal, and so they plead guilty. And then they appeal to us that the sentence was too long. And so it doesn't take long to dispose of some of these appeals, Dan. But we read them all and we consider them, and we give them a written decision. Well, you used the magic word, frivolous. I was afraid I was going to make you mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't make me mad. There's a lot of criticism that uh, our court system is overwhelmed with frivolous lawsuits. Now, you talked about criminal appeals. That's not the same thing. A frivolous lawsuit is, well, the joke is a frivolous lawsuit is any, name, any lawsuit that names me as a defendant. There can't possibly be any merit Correct. to it. Yeah. But uh, do you see as a problem frivolous civil lawsuits being filed by lawyers? Uh, I really don't. There are some filed, but uh, what I've seen uh, while I practice law and since I've been on the bench particularly, our circuit judges, our trial judges, make short work of them. And what I've also seen is that uh, our circuit judges have now been uh, freely uh, sanctioning lawyers, that is punishing lawyers, that file frivolous lawsuits. Uh, so while there are a few filed, I don't see many, but I do see our circuit judges making short work of them. Circuit judge has the power to dismiss a lawsuit in her or his, if, if in her or his opinion, the lawsuit is not meritoriously based. It does not make an arguable case out of it. Absolutely, but additionally, if he finds that it's frivolous, he can award fees and cost. And, and I'm seeing that more and more out of our circuit, circuit courts. And it doesn't take long to get around Morgantown, the lawyers, that judge dismissed a, a frivolous lawsuit and awarded uh, to the defendant attorney fees and costs. That, that uh, goes a long way in preventing other frivolous lawsuits. A lawyer would be foolish to file a lawsuit uh, against somebody seeking money damages, for example, uh, unless he was being paid hourly to do it, uh, it, say file a contingent fee lawsuit, because if it's frivolous, it's not gonna generate any money, and he, he she has wasted their time. That, you're absolutely correct, but uh, sometimes you have clients, particularly in spite suits, that is where somebody hates somebody else, they'll pay the lawyer but they hire to file this frivolous suit. So it's up to the lawyer to tell them no, your case is not meritorious. I'm not going to put my name on that. 
Well, I know one thing, if the trial judge starts dismissing it and starts awarding attorney fees and court costs against that lawyer and, and, and uh, the plaintiff, there won't be many. Chief Justice Menace Ketchum, thank you, sir, for joining us. Dan, thank you. Thank you also for being with us on behalf of the lawsuit, on behalf of the Law Works. I'm Dan Ringer. Good evening. On the Law Works website at thelawworks.org, you'll find a listing of recent The Law Works programs, additional information about this show's topic, and video of this and recent shows. You can also find The Law Works programs on YouTube and iTunes. If you would like to suggest a topic for a future The Law Works show, or if you're a school teacher and would like to receive a DVD of this show for classroom use, send us email at thelawworks at comcast.net or visit us on Facebook. The Law Works is produced in cooperation with the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the Mountain State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and the West Virginia University College of Law. The Law Works is made possible by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and legal system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. By the generous support of Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975, providing high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems, as well as PC-based systems. And by viewers like you, from West Virginia Public Broadcasting.